Okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks for coming down today. So today is the first lecture for our uh, Blockchain Fundamental series. So Blockchain Fundamental is going to be a series of workshops coming up starting from today, and uh, it's a bi-weekly, and we'll give you more information about that. Today, uh, the topic that we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to cover is Bitcoin overview. Uh, it's a high-level overview of Bitcoin protocol, as well as some uh, cryptography basics. Uh, my name is Alex, and I'm from, uh, this talk is brought to you by uh, Blockchain NTU. So for those of you who don't know, uh, we are Blockchain NTU, and we're a student-initiated, nonprofit academic club uh, here at NTU. So we're dedicated to foster a vibrant blockchain communities here at NTU and beyond. And we're committed ourselves to uh, strengthen and building the technical expertise among mem our members. And we want to empower the like-minded person, individuals like you, uh, who are interested in this, in this space. And we try to help you in pursuit of your interest in academic, your, your enterprise or entrepreneurial endeavor. So that is sort of our mission. And in terms of what we do, there are three pillars. I think uh, most of you who are sitting here today have already either gone through the interview or uh, came to our uh, info session. So like uh, once again, for those of you who haven't uh, heard of us before, we have uh, three departments, education, R&D, and consulting. Um, and for those of you who already signed up, have already finished the challenge, we are really grateful for your time and we've seen a lot of submissions. Uh, we, we'll be going through them uh, tonight and as well as tomorrow. So by the end of tomorrow, you guys will be hearing from us about the results, whether you get in the club or not. Uh, but once again, for everyone who already spent your time, do your research and finish the uh, challenge. We are really grateful for that. Okay. So uh, for the uh, blockchain fundamental course, uh, he, th these, these are some of the uh, admin stuff about this course. Uh, first of all, the formats. The formats is going to be, uh, can everyone see the, the font? <laughs> Great. Okay, so the format is going to be a bi-weekly workshop, which means uh, once every two weeks. Um, and right now, th we are trying to settle it on Monday, which is, I think, uh, where, most people, where most people are available, according to our you know, pool uh, during the in interview. So uh, each session is going to last from uh, an hour and a half and roughly to one hour and like, I don't know, three quarters. So, uh, and usually we're going to host it on Monday. Okay. Uh, the expectations. So what, do you, what would you expect out of us and our expectation out of you? For, for um, the expectation that you have for us, what you can get out of this blockchain fundamental series uh, or this lectures is going to be high level theories as well as low level details uh, of all the blockchain fundamentals, right? So uh, to, not just you know how it works, but at the same time, uh, how does it apply to other uh, to, to different industries, and how the math and crypto cryptography underlying all those blockchain uh, underlying this technology works. So that's your expectation out of us, and we are expecting your dedication, um, your participation, active participation, as well as uh, after the workshop, we'll be giving out some assignments, some reading materials where you have to uh, spend your own time uh, doing because. There's no way we can teach everything in two hours, like just once every two weeks. So uh, we expect you, uh, we highly encourage you, of course, uh, to read like crazy, okay? Um, there are gonna be a lot of uh, interesting materials that we're gonna be sharing together and sometimes even go through together uh, during our weekly sharing session, okay? Uh, and the last thing is, uh, I want this session to be as interactive or as you know, welcoming and you know, uh, relaxed as possible. So please ask questions. Uh, this, this, workshop is for you guys. So if you don't understand, or is, if, if there's anything I didn't explain well enough, or if you need any clarification, please raise your hand. Don't hesitate to interrupt me and then ask questions. So uh, I just wanna make sure that everyone who goes out of this door um, can take home a lot of you know, the knowledge that, that, we, that we share, um, not just on a slide, so you'll be able to explain to other people as well. Okay, so uh, is there any pre-requests? Of course, no. Uh, regardless of your background or the major that you're involved, the program that you're involved, either you are sales students or business students, this should, should be totally self-contained and should be totally fine. So if you find some kind of a gap, do not hesitate to come to us. We are willing to provide uh, more basic information for you to catch up, for example. Right. So uh, assignment, mostly, like I said, going to be reading materials. Uh, sometimes, so I think from... Uh, workshop, like fundamental course, uh, like lecture four onwards, there are going to be some smart contract coding. So there are going to be live coding. So uh, the assignments, there are going to be some, you know, coding tasks. And this is typically for uh, developers. But non-developers are definitely welcome to join uh, the, you know, the smart contract coding session. Um, at, at least you can get to get to know an idea of, you know, how that work or how does code or syntax roughly looks like, and you, you're able to read the code, right? So that's kind of the assignments wise. Uh, lastly, deliverables. 
So because this is mostly open to public, so uh, there's no such thing as deliverable, sorry, like what, what we're going to assess you, there's no such fi final or, or anything. Uh, so I think the deliverables for you guys, or at least the measurement uh, that you should set out for yourself is you're able to explain what blockchain is, how does it work to a 10 year old. Um, if you couldn't do it, there must be something that's missing. Okay, so please do ask questions if I didn't explain it well enough, um, or you know, there's anything you find you know tricky. Okay, cool. Uh, one last thing is the reference. So this course is heavily uh, based on a the Princeton the Princeton textbook. Some of you may already heard about it. Uh, it's called Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technology. Yeah, I see a lot of people are taking down this. We'll be sending out the PDF in the Telegram group. So we'll be sending out a free version of uh, PDF. So this is also a free version. Uh, written by Andrew Miller um, at all. Yeah. Um, and honestly, this is where I get started. Like two years ago, I read this book. This is the first book that I find satisfying, who's not talking about all the you know business aspects or the promising future of blockchain technology, but instead it covers all the technical details and how it works and how you should think it critically and in a more scientific way. So that's kind of the information uh, administrative stuff about this blockchain fundamental course. Anyone have any other questions? Okay, cool. So uh, about, us, about our speakers. So uh, our speaker lineup, um, th this workshop is gonna be conducted by me. And consecutively, they're gonna be uh, Derek, Junyu, and Clarice will all be, you know, take turns to be the uh, lecturer or the speaker. So uh, feel free to approach any of us after the workshop as well, if you have any other questions. Okay, so uh, that's uh, the this stuff. All right, so this is kind of the agenda for today's talk as well as the, the one that's coming up, okay? So we'll start by motivation. Why did Bitcoin even exist or came about, right? So we'll first talk about uh, before Bitcoin, what's the situation there? Um, and then we'll, we'll talk about uh, what kind of motivates and triggers Bitcoin to came about. So that's the first point, that's the first thing, uh, first item on our agenda. The second thing is we're gonna talk about the data structure as well as some uh, cryptographic basics that supports us to build a, a secure digital uh, digital ledger. So, and that's the second part. The third part that we're gonna be covering today is gonna be uh, pseudonymity. And this is what we're gonna be talking about, the identities on blockchain and how does it look like, okay? so. This is that what we, uh, the, the first three points, the first three items. It's going to be something that we cover today. And then uh, in the next workshop, we're going to be covering how, to, how does a network of nodes come to consensus and agree on the state of the ledger. And that's called a Nakamoto consensus in the, in, in the Nakamoto consensus in the Bitcoin case. Okay? That's something we're going to cover next, next session. And then um, and while we're putting all of the things that we learn, um, up until the fourth point, we're, we're going to come up with the, uh, the Bitcoin protocol and we're going to describe in details. And by that time, you should uh, have a very clear understanding of how it works um, and all the, all the technical details. Okay? So that's for the second and next two weeks from now. Okay, so let's start from the motivation. And we shall start way back. Back when we are like an Asian ancestors, what do they do if they want to do a trade? Um, if you are a farmer who has the rice that I want, and I am a fisherman who breeds the fish that you want, what we do is there's going to be a trade happening, because I need the rice and you need the fish, okay? So it's okay, and this kind of uh, transaction or commerce happens in a small scale, which is totally fine. But when the population as well as the economy grows, right, people still slowly define a big problem emerges, which is the coordination problem, right? Sometimes I have the fish, but you doesn't have the rice. Sometimes you have the rice and they don't have the fish, right? How does this, uh, if the market needs is growing and everyone is, is needing a different piece of the puzzle, like how do you uh, kind of have this perfect match at the same time? It's almost impossible. So uh, there are two ways that our smart ancestors came up with. The first is using a credit. The other is using cash, okay? So the basic, the very basic idea of credit is basically based on my reputation. You knew that I'm basically deferring my payments back in the future. So I will pay you back later on, let's say in, in two months time, when I have the fish, I'll give it to you. So uh, it's basically like a credit system that we're seeing right now where you spend first on your credit cards and then you'll pay back to the bank at the end of the month, for example. So that's the credit, credit system. Uh, that's one way to solve this coordination problem. The other way is we have a, uh, you know, exchange or median of, of, uh, of value, which is cash, right? So everyone agrees that this piece of paper with certain you know, 
serial numbers on it is valuable with uh, some very famous or significant figure on it, it's, it's valuable. So we agree on this. And we're going to have a standard and have a way to verify this is you know, uh, the cache that we produce. And then this is used as a uh, medium of exchange. So uh, when you give me something, I, I don't have to fish for you. I can give you cash instead. So that's, that's basically how it works. And we won't talk about the credit system because it's less relevant for our talk. We'll be talking about cash first. OK. So what's the advantage of having a cache to solve this coordination problem? Uh, first of all, there's no risk on default. So which means that I, I don't have to. So remember in the credit system, where I have to trust you that you're, gonna, you're able to pay me back, and you will be paying me back in a month time, for example. So if, let's say, you fail to do so, that's called a, a default. right? So it's the same thing where you are on a house mortgage or you are buying your house and you didn't pay the full price, uh, but you promised the bank that you will be slow in paying them back in the installment, right? So uh, the, the, the advantage of cash is that you are transacting at that time, so there's no trust required. I don't, I don't have to trust you any, anyway. I don't have to even have to know you, right? So that's, there's no default risk and the settlement is quick at that moment, okay? Another, pros, uh, another uh, advantage is, of course, is that there's no need, middleman needed. We can just do the transaction right at the spot. And it's totally offline. Okay. Uh, the next thing is better anonymity, right? So let's say we have a lot of transaction going on, and we're all using cash, which, which is one of the reasons why drug dealers all use cash, though. Um, if you're using digital ones, most likely you'll be traced, right? Something you can be recorded on, because when you're doing that transaction, there has to be verified that you, know, you actually have the money, right? The banks have to verify that. So there has to be a lock, or has to be something record that uh, record down this transaction. Okay. So compared to that, transaction uh, cash has this uh, properties or have this advantage of, of uh, better anonymity. Okay. So what are some of the cons of this cash uh, solution? So first of all, it's possible to make a counterfeits, and this is not news, right? Like we, we've seen people who try to you know uh, have a you know cash fraud uh, on a daily basis even. Okay. But the more important one is this inconvenience, right? So you, you have to be physically present in order to do that transactions, right? What happens if someone who wants to do a transaction like cross-continent, for example, that's going to be quite impossible. So that's kind of uh, the problem. Um, and then uh, to solve this inconvenient problem, what, we, what people came up with, of course, is just to digitize, digitize it and then bring it to uh, as a digital cache, that, which is something that we all use today, right? We, we, we store our, our, our money in the banks, right? DBS, city banks, whatever. Right? And then whenever we're doing a transaction, we're, doing, we're conducting digitally, and there's no physical presence required. So it is very convenient in a sense. So what are some of the pros of uh, digital cash? Uh, that the digital cash system that we have, which we're relying on like a central bank, who are trying to help us maintain this ledger or this, the, the, balance of everyone's, uh, the balance of everyone's account. Okay? First of all, it's very convenient, and the transaction is quite cheap. And then uh, the, way, the reason why we believe that such transaction is secure is because all those big banks that we trust on is uh, heavily scrutinized by either a regulatory bodies or like a monetary authorities. Okay? That's the reason why we trust banks to help us uh, conduct this. Um, but of course, at the same time, it comes with some disadvantages. The first is central point of failures. Right? Even though banks have very good security system, um, it's still like it's keeping the ledger to himself in his database. So there has been a lot of news, a lot of attacks on banks. For example, uh, just a couple of months back, uh, two Canadian banks were hacked, and almost 90,000 customers' data was stolen. Okay? So these, because when we're trusting banks, we're not just trusting with our balances. We're also trusting with our social security numbers, um, a lot of uh, private information. Okay? So uh, other than that, there's also Citibank has also, um, also was hacked before. And Italian largest ba uh, bank was hacked before. So uh, all of these news was sort of an evidence that uh, to have this kind of data silo, who is the only maintainer of this ledger, is some sort of uh, central point of failure. Where hacker, if hacker gets in, he can manage or he, he can he can uh, rewrite uh, some of the uh, the balance or some of the states however he wants. Okay. So that's kind of the digital cache. Um, like I said, other than external hacks. There is also probably internal corruption, uh, and this is also not news at, at all. It's like there's there are many <laughs> internal misconduct that results in a, a monetary fault. So, um, but when it comes down to the the real important one that I want to point it out of this the current digital cash system that we have, um, especially prior to uh, 2008, is that we have <laughs> a strong trust assumption 
on who should we trust to. And we think that those big banks are very trustworthy. And this assumption is being heavily you know, criticized by a special group of people, which we call them uh, cyberpunks. So cyberpunks is a group of activists um, who usually are uh, advocating for uh, more cryptography and privacy enhancing technology for social and political, cha political changes. So what they believe is that uh, they believe in smaller governments um, and they don't trust central authorities. They think if you are centralizing the power to a few or even a monopoly, then he can misuse that power. So that's basically uh, why cyberpunk is always advocating for decentralizing the power and giving more power to the individuals, giving more control to the individuals. So, uh, and cyberpunk is kind of a movement that started out way back from 80s, where the computer science um, and digitized world, uh, like digital life, started to you know emerge with our normal life. And other than that, um, one of the, their um, kind of philosophy is that uh, privacy is not entirely equal to secrecy. And I strongly recommend everyone to read this uh, read this blog post by one of my biggest hero, uh, Moxie Martin Spike. Um, he's the reason why you're using uh, WhatsApp securely right now, using end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, so he wrote this blog post uh, like many, many years back. I think it's in 2014 or 13. So this blog post is called "Why Should We All Have Something to Hide?" Uh, the basic idea, in, in a nutshell, is that uh, most of these social movements or advancement that we, we see today uh, were illegal or somewhat in the gray area at that time. For example, gay marriage uh, or legalizing of marijuana, prostitution. All of these things are considered illegal before, but then as people are opening out their, their minds, are thinking more critically, or at least you have this way of, of civil discourse, then you have a way of, let's say, uh, moving the this, this society forwards and have some social changes. So that's basically the kind of, uh, the, uh, the main idea of this blog post where, you see, where, where he says, uh, we, we should all have something to hide, um, regardless of our uh, political opinions or, or, or our personal life. So just one more thing, I think this is, a, this is also a very interesting kind of a philosophy because cyberpunk is the one who is actually pushing this Bitcoin um, a technology forward. And they are, the one, they are the reason why Bitcoin exists today. So they say privacy is, necess is necessary uh, for an open society in the electronic age. Right? Privacy is not secrecy. Uh, private matter is, someone, is something one doesn't want the whole world to know. Right? But the secrecy, um, but the secret matters is, is something uh, a secret matter is something that one doesn't want anybody to know, right? So basically saying that uh, the privacy is the power to selectively re review part of the thing that you want to share to the world. It's not like I don't want anything to be shared, um, but it's like I, I have the power to selectively choose what I want to share, which is something that you know, Facebook and Cambridge Analytica kind of uh, came about in, in, a, in a modern age and modern uh, discussion. So, right. So what happens in 2008? where we all remember the uh, big financial crisis, which started out with uh, the collapse of uh, Lehman Brothers, and then a national bailout uh, from the United States, and then the ripple effects, which affects the whole world for even sometimes, some country haven't recovered even a decade, which is right now, even decades from, from 2008, like Iceland, for example. Their economy is recovering, but it's still growing very slowly. So, um, and most of these, uh, the, the, the financial crisis is not just a few bad apples who caused this huge financial crisis. It's a chain of reaction and it's a, it's a totally fraudulent uh, system where a lot of players, big banks, uh, regulatory bodies are all falling asleep. And they are, they are, they are, so this is kind of internal corruption that I was talking about for uh, the, the centralized parties. So they're all falling asleep, they're not doing their job. And even the, as a government, right, you are supposed to regulate and scrutinize those big banks. But instead, what they do is they, well, either they are bribed or uh, they're, well, big banks spend millions of dollars on like uh, lobbyists to lobby uh, those, you know, Washington politicians to uh, constantly deregulate the financial markets and have more and more leverage. Like you can have one to 20 leverage on certain uh, mortgage bond, for example. So. This is something, uh, so uh, of course, I mean, some of the uh, high-ranking bankers, they go to jail after the, uh, the 2008 financial crisis, but that's a big outcry. So the idea, the message that I'm trying to uh, convey is the things that we think is too big to fail has failed. And that's a very uh, alarming message that, that, that I want to send out. So that's also kind of the motivation that the cyberpunks is always pushing forwards, try to build something that, you know, circumvent this kind of scenarios. So I hope that gives a rough idea. And when we reached out this motivation, you understand like a rough basic histori historical story of, of why Bitcoin exists. So the motivation 
for Bitcoin basically is uh, we try to have the benefits of the digital cash, which is very convenient. And you want to transact cross-border, uh, cross-continent very conveniently. And at the same time, um, you, you don't want to do it with, 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 a trust, with, a, with a heavily trusted party. So you want to do it without a trusted party. So that's kind of the, the, the motivation. Okay. So in October 2008, there's a paper uh, airdropped um, on the internet. And it's been written by Satoshi Nakamoto. And no, so it's a, it's a very funny mystery even to this date because no one knows the real identity of who this uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is. Some people speculate that it can be even a woman. It can be a group of researchers. Uh, but it's very interesting that um, many people are coming out claiming themselves to be Satoshi uh, nowadays and saying, you know, I'm the, the founder or I'm the uh, inventor of Bitcoin. But anyway, so Bitcoin paper has also been uh, heavily cited in, in academia. So this is uh, kind of the background of Bitcoin. So instead of going directly into this Bitcoin white paper, uh, the, the, the path that we try to choose is we try to decompose this Bitcoin protocol into different parts in our talk so that we can crack them one by one and then took a quite modular approach and to combine them together so that you can understand uh, the Bitcoin uh, paper you know, uh, better later on when you read it because it's a quite multidisciplinary field and it contains a quite a lot of uh, background uh, and, and knowledge in, in cryptography, etc. So it's kind of approach that we're going to take. Once again, the goal for this talk as well as the next one is going to, we want to build a secure digital cache with pseudonymity without central authorities, okay? Once again, this is the goal. So this is gonna be something that we always refer back to. When we learn something new, you should think about what am I, uh, the thing that I'm learning, how does it relate to the goal that we finally we're trying to achieve here, okay? So we're trying to build a secure digital cache with pseudonymity without central authority. And I'll be explaining, for example, what the pseudonymity means. But that's kind of uh, the theme throughout this talk, okay? So um, to solve the first problem, we're going to need to introduce some new, uh, not really new, but some data structure as well as some cryptography to solve the first, how do you, how do you make it secure, right? How does it make the digital ledger secure? To solve the second one, we're going to introduce the identities on Bitcoin. To solve, to solve the third one, the, thir the third line, is gonna be, we're going to be introducing distributed consensus, which is going to be covered next talk. So I hope... This gives you an idea why are we splitting up the agenda uh, like we just introduced. Once again, we're try we already covered the motivation, why Bitcoin came about. Now we're going to move on to the data structure and the cryptography to enable us to build the first line of our goal, which is a secure digital ledger. And then we'll be uh, covering the identity on blockchain, which is we want to achieve with pseudonymity. And next term, we're going to cover Lakamoto consensus, which is how do we have a group of people um, you know, come to agreements uh, on a peer-to-peer -peer network. Okay, so that's kind of a logical guideline. Once again, uh, the just to give you a visual understanding of uh, or, or agenda for us. So we start building like the data data structure. So the reason why we want to start a data structure is you want to understand how ledger is being constructed, what's inside the ledger, right? So once you have that, what we're gonna do is um, you have uh, two people, right? Um, then who who are they and how can they join the network? That's the identity problem. How are they represented on the Bitcoin network, right? So that's their identity on Bitcoin. So that's the second topic. And then uh, the, the topics that we're going to cover next week is what happens if there are a group of people, a group of users who are going to join the network. And how do they, because the, all of them have a piece or a copy of the ledger, then the, le the copy can be, you know, there can be discrepancy between two, any two copies. So how do they agree on the state of the ledgers? So that's the one that we're going to talk about next week. So I hope this, this you know, kind of graph or diagram uh, gives you an idea of how do we decompose Bitcoin protocol into uh, you know, s several modules and how, how we're going to cover them. Okay, so uh, let's go on to the next, which is the biggest part of today's talk, uh, which is blockchain, the data structure and cryptography uh, basics. So uh, because I understand that uh, some of you are from a CS background while the others are not. So for so I'm going to cover some basic definition just to make sure that we're on the same, same line here. Um, so for those CS students, I apologize. Please bear with me. Uh, these are pretty basic for you, but uh, it can be good you know, if, if you go through together just to, to make sure that we are on the same page. Okay? So these are the, the, the few terms that I'm going to regularly refer back to. Um, and when we talk about algorithm, you can think of a, a diagram or a flowchart that uh, you know, help you decide something. So you have a task. 
and you have a uh, defined set of steps to reach a goal or to give a result, to output a result. For example, uh, it, how baby make decision is like, okay, is this a food? And there are a, let's say he will collect the data, yes or no, and then he will make a decision. So the output is gonna be the action that he take. Okay, so this is the algorithm that we talk about. So of course, algorithm can be more difficult than this, can be more complicated, where you have a loops, uh, where you can have a different path, a very uh, huge you know, a decision tree, for example. So, but in general, that's, uh, that's algorithm, okay? Um, data structure, so why do we even talk about data structure? And for those non-CS background, uh, data structure is basically how we want to store our data and the relationship between them. Uh, for example, if we are storing some data, data structure, like you can think of all the, the kind of data in the, um, <coughs> as the, all, those, all those cups, and let's say I want to fill, the, uh, fill some water into uh, all of these cups. In what order do I fill, fill them into? And what relationship do they have with each other? Those are kind of uh, data structure uh, they were talking about. Okay. So uh, the next thing is protocol. So uh, many people have confusion uh, with like protocol and, um, and algorithm, which is so, if you can imagine that if you are a chef, um, you're cooking at your own home, a kitchen at home, uh, protocol is basically defined what is, right? Knife is used to cut things, vegetables, meat, what, whatsoever. Uh, pot is used to, you know, as a container for, for, for your food, uh, for your materials, etc. So protocols is a set, basically a set of rules Okay? that determines how the system will function. So we, uh, typically within, within a system, there are a lot of uh, components and they are, they are interacting with each other all the time. So protocol is defining how they interact, interact with each other all the time, as well as uh, you know, a lot of rules that determines how does it function, right? That, that's basically the idea. But algorithm is telling some system what to do. Okay? So once again, the protocol is, is you know, protocol tell you what is, and algorithm tell you how to do something. And, and the algorithm does. So the algorithm takes something and they define a set of steps and it'll give you something out, okay? Uh, but the protocol is different. So in a sense, what, how does it connect to or relate to our context? So the Bitcoin is a protocol because it defines how the components inside interact with, the, with each other and a set of rules to determine you know, how, how this entire Bitcoin uh, you know, system work. So that's a protocol. But like proof of work, which is the consensus algorithm that we'll be covering next session, it's an algorithm because what it gives out, there's an output. The output is you know, the agreed states uh, among all the, all, all, all the nodes. So just to give you an idea uh, of the protocol and algorithm. Okay, uh, now last one is computer network. Right? Computer network, I just wanna talk about uh, two very simple topology. The first is the client server uh, diagram paradigm. The other is the peer-to-peer -peer paradigm. So on the left side, you can see a client server paradigm. Um, this is usually how you get uh, the, the kind of services that we're enjoying nowadays. For example, YouTube, uh, Google search, these are all using a client server where there are a lot of users who when they try to query something or try to get some content, what they're doing is they're sending a request to a central serv server who's serving all the data, right? If you're trying to watch a YouTube video, that's you basically, you're asking the YouTube server and the YouTube server will, 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 will return that data to you. Uh, on the contrary, and there's a clear uh, classification of different roles that's being, paid, uh, being played um, in this client server paradigm, right? Someone is serving you and someone is enjoying the data, okay? So there's a clear classification of, of the role that you play and there's kind of a, a hierarchy there. And then for peer-to-peer, -peer, um, it's like everyone is the server and the client at the same time. So you're serving the, the file for other people as well as collecting, um, you know, collecting data if you're downloading data from other, for, for other nodes. So that's kind of uh, two topology um, that we usually refer to. So the second one is kind of peer-to-peer um, when we say like peer-to-peer, -peer, we, we like refer to them uh, all the time, and that's what we're referring to. So, do anyone have any question on that? Okay, good. So, let's go back to our goal. Uh, in the first line, we want to build a secure digital cache. Okay. So, when I say secure digital cache, the first thing, of course, you should ask is, what do I mean? How do we define secure? Right? What do we mean by security? Right? So the first thing is, what I want to do if I have a coin, for example, in the real life, and you can do analogy to the digital cash, is that I want to prove a valid ownership of that assets, right? It can be a coin, can be some digital assets. So the first thing I want to do is if I claim that I have that, I'm the owner of that assets, of that coin, I can prove it to you and other people can do a validity check on that ownership, 
right? That's the first thing. It's pretty obvious, right? That's the first thing I want to do if I say that I, I own this coin, or it, it, you know. So other people couldn't couldn't claim do the same claim because th th this coin belongs to me. So they couldn't provide the same valid claim than I do. Okay. So um, another thing is, if I didn't claim that I want to transfer this coin to someone else, other people couldn't. Okay. Once again, no one can steal or spend money on my behalf. Right. Only if I want to transact the coin. Will I be able to? Will the coin be spent? Right. There's no way people can, you know, do it on my behalf. Okay. So that's kind of uh, security that we're talking about. This is the first point, which is proof of ownership. Okay. Uh, the second thing is no double spending. Okay. The idea of no double spending is when someone receives, or let's say you receive a coin um, from Bob, let's say, you have to make sure that this coin hasn't been spent previously to someone else. Right? The Bob couldn't double spend. If he double spend, at least, you can have a mechanism to detect that. So you wouldn't accept that coin. Okay? Um, and it will make more sense later on. But these are the two points, or these are the two <laughs> criteria any secure digital cash has to, satis has, to, has to satisfy. Okay? Now, for the first part, uh, proof of ownership. Okay? Um, I think the best way to understand it is to do analogy in the real life. Um, how do you prove some asset are yours, or let's say a cash <coughs> is valid, right? So basically, let's say uh, on, the, on the left here, there's the, the Singapore dollars, and the way that we say that this, this dollar is valid is either because it has some distinguished feature that cannot be forged by other people, right? Other people couldn't fake, a, a just basically a fake one, and there's serial number on that, right? Which, which is like almost also uh, un, unforgeable, and the banks have kind of <coughs> keep track of the serial number that he has issued, so that's one thing. The other thing is uh, on the right here is a is a note, or it's like um, if you borrow a money from someone else, and I say you know I'm gonna return it to you, um, and you, you you did lend me some money, and I'm gonna return it to you, and you have your signature sign on that, right? So uh, the assumption is either you stamp on it or you sign on it. So the assumption, of course, is no one can forge your signatures, or no one can forge the stamp. The stamp is something unique to you, and once I saw that stamp, I knew it was you. Okay? So that was kind of uh, how we solve security or how do we prove something is actually owned by someone in the real life. Does that make sense? Okay, so how does that you know, transfer or relate to uh, the digital world? Basically, as we can see, the, the common similarities shared by them is this, this idea of unforgeable stamp. Right? We see this occur re recurring uh, you know, theme over and over again is this unforgeable stamps. So in order to do an unforgeable, unforgeable stamp in the digital area, we have to take a detour to the material cryptography and, uh, you know, and we're going to be introducing uh, digital signatures. So digital signatures is used to solve this proof of ownership and validity of something, um, uh, this problem. And how do we build an unforgeable stamp? So in a nutshell, um, digital, signature, digital signature algorithm um, have a pair of keys. So uh, any, anyone who try to you know, uh, prove that something is yours, you can first of all create a pair of keys. So there are a pair of keys, so there are two keys. One is called the public key, the other is called private keys. So by its name, you receive, so one is public and the other is private. So the private key is supposed to kept to yourself. It's supposed to be a secret, right? That you do not reveal to other people. So how does this digital signature algorithm works is that when you try to prove to someone and you try to sign something digitally, what you do is you take the message, and um, you as well as, and your private key, and you uh, apply a function on it, and then you will produce a digital signature. Okay. Once again, you sign the database, you sign some message using your private key, and it will result in a digital signature. Okay. So this digital signature, when you pass them to someone else, other people can verify it. Why? First of all, we have your public key. So this is another function which is called verify. So they take the signature that you provided to them, and they have this message as well as uh, your public key. So they, 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 uh, they, they also put, push all of those, those three parameters to a function called verify. And then what comes out of it is the original message. Okay? So uh, if the message matches, matches up, then he knows it is actually from you. So how, why is this um, unforgeable? First of all, uh, the assumption is you are not revealing the private key to any other people. So, um, and also there are some other one-wayness that I'll be introducing later on. But that's kind of the high-level overview of how does the digital signature works. So just once again, you have a key pair, public key and private key. There are two functions that you have to um, totally understand, okay? So the first one is once again sign. You take a message, 
uh, private key apply, uh, apply on that, then you get your digital signature. This signature specifically say, this come from me. This came from a person who hold this secret key. No one else can, can, can produce the same digital signature. So I gave two counter examples. The first one is, let's say I change the private key. I don't sign this, that with my private key. I sign with something else, okay? What comes out of it is completely gibberish, okay? It will, not, it will, it will be nothing close to your digital signatures, okay? That's one counter example. The second example is, let's say I sign another message. What comes out of it is another digital signatures, which is also very completely different from the original digital message that we're, try, that we're trying to produce, okay? These are the two properties of this sign function, okay? Once you sign that and you pass down the digital signature to someone else, someone wants to verify it, then you have to use this verify function. So this verify function takes three parameters. They take the public key that you, that you share to the public world. For example, you tweet it, saying this is my public key. So probably if you go on Twitter and you see someone who's doing cybersecurity, many, most likely you will see his uh, PGP key, which is his public key for his email addresses and et cetera, and he will post it on his Twitter. And you can use that to encrypt some message to him, and also you can verify whether a message is, is signed by him, okay? So once again, verify takes three parameters, the public key, the signature that you just signed, as well as the original message, okay? So what this function will output is yes or no. Either this message is from, is actually um, signed by you, and, and the message is signs up, uh, the message ma matches up, or not, okay? So once again, two counter examples. If let's say someone tried to uh, forge the signature, providing me with a different or random variables on the second field here, which is not the signature that you actually signed, so the, the, the function would definitely output no. Okay, or at least with a very, very high probability, you, you, you will uh, output notes. No, okay, and then, and then the second counterexample is that let's say uh, the message is different. So there's no way you can find two messages with the same uh, digital signatures. And that's probabilistically, like astronomically low probability for you to find something like that, okay? Now, um, do anyone have any other questions until this point about digital signatures? Because DSA, um, is something that we're going to be using over and over again, and it's critical, essential for you to understand the, 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 the concept. Do anyone want me to do any clarification? Everyone get it totally, perfectly? Nodding? Okay, cool, thank you. Awesome. So, um, if you understand that part, this part is more for uh, like the 20% more depth, in depth. It, it's not that relevant to our context, so you can relax a little bit. And for those of you who are interested in cryptography, you can listen on, okay? So just, uh, you can relax a little bit. This is less relevant for you to understand how Bitcoin protocol works. So um, the exact uh, DSA algorithm that we use in Bitcoin, as well as in Ethereum, is called elliptic curve uh, DSA. And we can, we can give a more deep dive next semester on how does elliptic curve work, and the abstract uh, algebra underlies it, and also some number theory, why it is, is it hard. Okay, but that would not be covered in today. So uh, once again, so elliptic curve is basically a curve, and each point on that on that curve, um, so w w is consists of uh, coordinates uh, on this graph. Okay, so the x-axis, uh, the x-point, as well as the y, y point. Okay, so, and and there is going to be a, a operation on this graph. So for example, if you want to multiply uh, multiply a point, there's there's going to be a coordinating operation to tell you how to move the points and to get the next point, for example. If you want to add, let's say, P plus P on this, uh, if there's a point, right, P plus P, so there's going to be a coordinating points uh, to that result, uh, you know. So uh, I think one key question that people, uh, one like main question that most people ask is like, how do I generate my key, right, the private key? I, I knew there's a pair of key, but where does the pair of key come from, right? So there's a, there's a key generation function. Um, and basically, the uh, protocol that it goes through is first of all, you randomly select a private key. Okay? This private key is something you, you select from random. So maybe you ask, where does the random come from? So uh, just to give you a sense, if you're using a laptop, there is a, for example, you're using Linux or, uh, or any system basically, you have, the system already have a, like a, a utility function, which you can call and get a, a, a random source or random C from that. And how do they get that? It's basically through hardware. Every click of my mouse, every every uh, when I type any keyboards or when I move or if there's any uh, you know activity at all on my laptop, there's gonna be uh, it's gonna contribute to a so-called entropy pool. Okay, so this entropy pool is where all the source, the random source, come from. Okay, so uh, th there's gonna be a lot of pseudo random uh, pseudo random functions as well. You know, you have to go through. But anyway, so the idea is that there is almost no way for you to predict 
you know, how are going to act, right? And there's going to also, they will test the temperature, for example. They take a lot of uh, things that are completely unpredictable and becomes the random source. So it, if you want to get some random uh, number or if you like, uh, basically, uh, that, that's basically how you get it from the hardware, okay? So first of all, you, you select a random, random private key and you keep it to yourself. Once again, this is secret, okay? What you do with that random key is that you will derive your public key from the private key, okay? So it's de deterministic. If you have a private key, you only have one public key, okay? So this derive of, uh, de uh, key derivation function is deterministic, okay? So, uh, and very interestingly, uh, the key length, first of all, is uh, 2015 six bit. Of course, in ECDSA, there are multiple different key length, but the one that we're using in Ethereum as well as in Bitcoin is using the two, uh, 256 bits, okay? So one very, very interesting uh, thing that you will notice is that just from the public key, there's no way you can derive back to the private key. Otherwise, there's no point at all, right? If I, because I'm broadcasting my, my public key. If you, can, if you can derive the private key from public key, then there's no security at all, right? So the idea is this one witness. This one witness is based on, so you may ask, where does this one witness, like I've never encountered any one witness in, in my previous study of math, right? Anything, there's a function, there's an inverse function, right? Why should that, like an inverse function, why should this be only one way? So um, the intuitive understanding for this is that there are some really hard problem in number theories or some in computational complexity theory, like it's some NP-hard problem, uh, which means that it, we might take a non-deterministic or even uh, uh, like more than, like it's exponential time, you know, uh, compared to, to the inputs, exponential time to compute the results, or sometimes it doesn't even halt, it doesn't, couldn't even find a result, that you don't know whether you can find a result or not. So, so basically you can, you can think of all the one witness is basically from, is derived from something that is really, really hard to compute. So um, you can compute one way, but not the other way around. So that's the general idea of, of uh, why people couldn't derive their private key from your public key. So another question that I get uh, last week was, why not I just guess your private key directly, right? Since I couldn't derive it, I, I can't just guess your private key. And if I guess it correctly, then I have your all your money, right? Because you are signing, I can sign on your behalf. I can even forge your, forge your signature. So the idea is the two, 256 bits over here. So how many possibilities are there if I have 256 bits? Two to the power of 256 bits. And how big is that? And how long does that take? And how lucky you have to be in order to find the exact match? So someone on, on Reddit, who are apparently very free and doesn't have anything to do, um, actually calculated. So he says that uh, using Tianhe, so Tianhe is the supercomputer uh, right now in China. I think it's probably the high, if not the fastest supercomputer right now in the world. So it will take you know, uh, 10 to the power of 38 Tianhe supercomputers to run um, for the existence of everything, which means the existence of use numbers up until now, which is billions and billions of years. And you couldn't, have, you couldn't even exhaust, so it's like an exhaustive search, right? You, I'm going through all the private key. You couldn't even go through half of the, uh, the key space. So that's kind of how hard it is. So if you want to try to get a guess, and to guess Vitalik or you know Satoshi's private key, um, do not make that attempt. Uh, otherwise, you will end up doing that all your life without doing anything else. Okay. So I hope that gives a, a, a nice overview of you know how the how the key generation function works. Okay. So now uh, up until this point, people understand DSA. DSA okay. Um, and if you're sleeping right now, it's time to wake up again. Uh, the hard part just gone away. Okay. Nice. Right. So right now. With this digital signature, we can do some pretty interesting and pretty fun thing. Okay, so for example, let's say NTU uh, award me or like um, you know I don't know subsidize me for giving this talk for free. Okay, he says I'm gonna give you a coin called NTU coin. Right, it doesn't worth anything, but it might be worth. It might it might be right. Okay, he says this. So the message is create coin one. Okay, unit one. So this is the message that he said, and then he signed it using his private key. Okay, so he signed it. So once I have that. At least this is a valid signature from NTU. No one else can, can forge it. Does everybody agree on that? Because he has a secret key. Okay, so what happens is, once you have this coin creation transaction, he can have one, another one, which is transferred, right? He wanna transfer this coin. Right now it's owned by him, uh, it's, it's owned by NTU. Okay? Right now he wanna award this or transact that, transfer that coin to me. So what does he do? He says, I'm gonna pay this coin to someone, to a public key, okay? which is my public key, okay? So I'm using Alice, but you know, the same thing. Alice, Alex, doesn't matter. So he, he paid to someone with a public key specified over there. And he says, basically saying, anyone who can provide a signature 
who's coming out of that public key can spin that coin. Let me, let me repeat that once again. So what N2 is basically saying that this coin, which is created by me, and you can all verify this all actually created by N2U, is only spendable by someone with that public key. Okay? So if someone can provide a signature that is signed by the secret key that corresponds to that public key, can spin this coin. Is that sufficient enough for me to spend the coin? Yeah, the answer is yes, because I'm the only one who can provide a digital signature that's signed with that secret key. Okay? Do you, I think I, I see some uh, confusing faces. Um, okay, once again, once again. So this is the coin creation. Okay, I think everyone is agree uh, already agree on this. You know, this is only created by NT, uh, NTU, and no one can forge it. Now, NTU sign another message. He want to transfer this to me. And he's basically saying, you know, this coin is only spendable by someone who have the corresponding private key of, that pub, of, of this public key. So this is, the, this is the message itself. The message says this. So other people can verify whether the signature that he later on received actually have, uh, is actually from this public key. Okay? So that's basically saying only someone who has the private key uh, you know, that, that, that corresponds to this public key could, could spend it. Okay. I hope that's sort of clear right now. Okay, great. Awesome. So uh, what happens is if, if I want to spend a coin, what do I do here? I just bundle the entire thing and I send it to you, right? I bundle the entire thing and I say I will sign another message, for example. I send another, me another message saying this entire thing is spendable by someone with a public key of Bob. For example, if I want to spend to Bob. Okay, so that's kind of uh, the spending transaction that I do because right now, then Bob can verify that I actually I have this entire coin. Does that make sense? This is a coin transaction. This is a coin creation that by NTU. NTU verifies uh, or or sort of uh, proof that he can he will oh, no he he uh, uh, sign that he will give this to me. And right now, if I want to give to someone else, I just sign the entire message and say I will, I'm willing to give to someone else. That's how it works. <laughs> Any questions? Go ahead. Okay, no? Okay, so it seems that it's okay, but here's uh, a very tricky tricky point here, is it's okay if NTU only sign one coin transaction, or, or one coin creation. What happens is like two years ago, he signed to someone else with another coin creation. And me, being a smart guy, what I do is, I don't bundle with this, this you know, coin creation that NTU give me. I copy paste another one that, that NTU used to sign two years ago and I bundle them together, and I give it to someone else, okay? So th does, that, does this question, does that problem, you know, <coughs> understand, it's understandable to you guys? Okay, so the question is, basically, how, do we, how, how can we bond the two transactions, to, uh, the message or the signature together, right? When NTU trying to give me this coin, what he's trying to do is he wants to say that, so this is the, the, the coin transfer, which is transferring to me. Right? He's trying to say that this one, this guy, can only spend this coin. He doesn't want to say that this guy can spend any coin that I used to create. Okay? So I want to try to sort of like create this bond in between this coin transfer to this coin creation. Right? There, there has to be some sort of link where I have to specify in this message itself, saying that this message is referring to this one particularly. Okay? And in order to do that, brings us to our next cryptography basics, okay? Which is hash function. Okay. So when we're talking about hash functions, uh, we're sometimes it's also used to. Uh, sometimes it's also being described as a message digest. So the way that you can think of or visualize it is that you can think of it as a, as a, as a what, what do you call it? Meat producer. What do you call this? Okay, sure, go ahead, okay, whatever that is, okay? So the way it works is that you're taking a long plain text. You can think of it as a, um, so the funny analogy is that you can think of it as a kitchen, and what comes out of it is, is nuggets, okay? So you're taking a very long plain text, and what comes out of that meat machine is gonna be a short digest, okay? Let me give you an example. Okay. Uh, this is just a random long text, okay? N2 is number 11 on QS ranking higher than Blah, 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 you know, bite me. Okay, anyway, so this is a long random text. Okay? And I can, this is a long plain text, as I said, so quite long. It can be gigabytes of, uh, in length. 
But what comes out of, so SHA1 is one of the hash functions, and I'll be introducing later on. But anyway, so what comes out of it is a very, relatively, very, very short hex stream. Okay? As you can see, that's how the digest, right? You eat food. Sorry, that's quite disgusting. Anyway, so it's a short digest. Okay, so another thing is that um, the one that you are inputting into this hash function is sometimes called the pre image. The one that's coming out is sometimes called the, high, the hash digest, okay? So there are a few properties of this hash function that is desirable or that is usable for us, right? Because we're trying to, remember we're trying to solve the bond the two, you know, uh, the message function, uh, the message, bond the two message problem. And the way that we're trying to do that is we want to have a short representation of that one message, which is the coin creation transaction, right? We want to have a short representation, and we, we want to include that short present, representation in the message itself so that people can verify that it is actually referring to that original coin creation message. Does that make sense? I want to have a pointer, basically. I want to refer to that message. And how do I do that? I, want to I, I don't want to include the entire message, otherwise it's going to be too long, right? So I want, to, I want a short representation or short digest. So that's where the hash function comes about. So there are a few properties that we have to keep in mind when it comes to the hash function. The first is, it's a one-way function. So here comes the one-wayness, once again. So this is a reoccurring theme in cryptography. So this is basically what a lot of the encryption, basically all the encryption as well as cryptography is based on, is this one-wayness uh, assumption. Um, if someone break P, if they can prove P equals MP, then you know, most of the, so basically you're saying a lot of the hard problem is not hard anymore. So the sort of the re reverse or inverse function is doable. Then we're pretty much doomed. All the encryption that, most of the encryption that we have right now is based on this one witness assumption. Okay, so once again, this is very interesting. So there are two properties that I want you guys to remember. The first is reverse calculation is hard. It's super, super hard. It's very, very difficult to calculate something uh, that, you know, from, from the other direction. There's no way, judging from the digest, there's no way from the nuggets you can guess what a chicken looks like, okay? There's no way you can see the highest digest and see what the premage is like, okay? That's a stupid analogy, but it works. Um, another thing is that um, a small change in the pre-image, a very, very small change in the pre-image will, will result in a completely different digest. Will result in a completely different digest. This is also very important, okay? So I'll give you an example here. So let's say the first message is, thank you, blockchain to you, okay? The second message only add an exclamation mark at the, at the back, for those of you who couldn't see. I only add one exclamation mark, okay? So, but the result of this hash function is completely different. It's not like one or two digits that's different because that's more, more or less guessable, right? So uh, this is kind of the very, very nice property that hash function has. And we, have, we all have to keep in mind because um, without these, these, these properties, it wouldn't be safe, okay? Right, uh, so up until this point, anyone have any questions with, re regarding hash function and how does, like, you know, anyone has any question on that? So you couldn't have an inverse hash? Uh, so the question is, you couldn't have an inverse of a hash. That is correct. You couldn't have an inverse hash. There's no way you could, you know, judging from nuggets, guessing the chicken. Okay. And uh, if if you let's say if you find two pre-image that results in the same digest, which in in, in theoretically it definitely will happen because digest has a shorter length than the message space. It's have a shorter space. So there must be two items in the message space that you know, points to the same item or same digest in the digest space, right? In the ciphertext space. But the probability is astronomically slow, astron astronomically small. So if you find two images that corresponding to the same digest, it's called a pre-image or collision. So hash function sometimes is so called a collision resistant function. That is one of the reasons you couldn't find any collision in, in the, uh, yeah. But once again, it's, this one weakness is based on some very hard problem in math. Does that answer your question? Yeah, go ahead. So it's kind of like module. Uh, no, so when you talk about module, I think you're, you're, you're referring to the abstract path that's underlying it. But for example, a discrete log problem in RSA. Uh, so RSA is this uh, one encryption that um, used to be very, very uh, popular, but it's, it's been proven not that secure. So, uh, so basically the, the idea RSA is based on um, it is also like a very hard problem that's easy to do one way, but not the other way around. So one way is to, it's easy to, to do a exponential in the modular space. Yes, in the modular calculus, it's easy to do exponential, but it's very, very hard to do a log, logarithmic, uh, log, uh, the log of, this, of, uh, of a certain number, okay? So that's called a discrete log problem. 
Okay, this grid local problem is considered really, really hard. And that is one reason um, you know, it's hard for you to deduce the private key out of public key if you're using RSA as your uh, you know, um, you know, digital signature algorithm. Okay. So, but yeah, but modular, modu modular calculus is something um, that a lot of uh, the encryption scheme is based on. Yes. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, great. So, on the next few slides, uh, it's going to be for people who are more interested in cryptography. So, it's, once again, it's less relevant to uh, how Bitcoin works, but uh, since that's what I enjoy, so I, I'll, I'll be covering this. So, uh, at least if you, you have something, for those who, you, who are already familiar with Bitcoin protocol, you at least have something to bring home or have some bring food at least, okay? So, uh, there are actually two types of hash function when people refer to it, okay? There, the first one is called, you, you, we always refer to as a universal hash function. So, they are the key hash. In a sense, the hash function just now, right? The the meat the meat machine only accepts one parameter, which is the uh, plain text, okay? But for this one, for the universal hash function, it's a key one, so they will receive another key. This key is like a secret, right? It's like another secret key, and produce something out. So um, so M MAC is like MAC is a message authentication code. So instead of the uh, authenticated encryption, they are using this uh, Cardinal Wackman, Wackman MAC. It doesn't matter. So anyway, so just to for your information, there are two type uh, two types of hash functions. So for the second second type, which is usually referred to as a collision resistant hash, is the one that we're using, okay? It's the one that's more relevant in our context, okay? So they are keyless hash. There's no key at all, right? There's no key involved. There's only one uh, input over there. Okay, so some of the examples of uh, well-known and widely de uh, deployed hash function includes SHA-1, MD5, SHA-256, and SHA-3, okay? I'll be just giving you one example, or a few examples, one example for each, so at least you knew like where was it being used. It's not just something I, you know, uh, that's only for cryptography. It's be actually being extensively used, just that you probably don't know. Okay. So first of all, SHA-1. If you ever used GitHub before, you're using SHA-1. Okay. So I think a lot of you have already taken the uh, technical challenge that we posted up, and you basically are using uh, already use GitHub. So whenever you do a GitHub commit, or when you're using Git, which is the virtual control, um, a file virtual control, right? You are committing that, and he has to. How do you know that the, the next time he knows that the file changes, right? You will compare. So basically, you will hash all the, the all the files and have a digest of that what you have been committed last time. Okay. So the next time, if the file is being changed, I can calculate another hash, and then if the hash doesn't match, I know the the, the, the file is being changed. Okay. So that's why basically you'll see uh, those, those gibberish or those uh, head string over there is being concat is being concatenated. Sorry, it's being truncated from the original long SHA-1 ha hash outputs, okay? Uh, using those uh, on GitHub for sure, okay. So, uh, but the sad news, of course, is SHA-1's, uh, the collision has, has been found last year by Google, um, so, and they have a very, very funny name, the project, uh, the project team called uh, Shattered. Uh, so, you can, you can definitely, I put the link out, out there, uh, so you can definitely read their paper as well as, um, you know, how they find. So basically, they find two different pre-image that comes up, come down to the one, the, the exact same digest. Uh, but once again, uh, it's, uh, GitHub already posted how they sort of uh, migrate this problem, and it's not a big problem because it's not like you already you can deterministically produce two like two pre-image that, that comes to one digest. So this is only one instance being found, but it's, it's still considered being being broken. Uh, but SHA-1 has some like migration. So GitHub has some migration on this uh, SHA-1 being broken uh, uh, situation. Another thing that we usually he heard, uh, which is more popular in 90s, is like uh, MD5, uh, probably also uh, early 21st century. So it's, it's usually, it's being extensively used in Microsoft uh, op operating system. Um, uh, often it's, it's a utility file, and um, so whenever you are starting up, boost up your new, uh, the, the computer, basically the system is checking some of the core utility function. Uh, for example, like the kernel file, the kernel code. Um, you will be verifying that whether it's being changed by some hacker, for example. Let's say you lost your computer, and uh, or you, you send your computer for maintenance, and then the guy who returned to you actually changed some code in your kernel, uh, which means that he can either, I don't know, um, install a backdoor on your computer, then he can monitor you or, or something like that. So all the key uh, utility function inside the micro, Microsoft OS uh, will, will have to, to calculate this hash to make sure that the, ch the file hasn't been changed before. So this is called integrity check. In integrity check. Okay, uh, but right now I think um, I'm not sure about the, the latest updates. I think uh, Microsoft probably used another hash function, but this is, has been you know uh, extensively used. Uh, MD5 is also found being broken by a Chinese professor, uh, Prof Wang, and uh, it's also one of the most highest cited uh, paper out there. 
and this is just you know just for fun. It's very interesting. Yeah. So the one. Okay. So if you're sleeping before, it's okay. Uh, you can wake up right now because SHA-256 is the one that we're gonna cover. SHA-256 is the one that's being extensively used in Bitcoin and Ethereum cases and in many other cryptocurrencies. Okay. The reason why it's called SHA-256. Okay. I don't. I, I don't like. Okay. Uh, 256 came from the outputs being the length of 256. So the short digest is always, is always 256 bits, regardless of how long the original message is. Okay, let's say I have one bit file, which is one or zero, okay? I put it into there. What, I, what, what this function will do is, you see the, uh, the padding block over there? So it will, add, it will ask me to a full block because I only have one bit, okay? So it will input, input to this so-called uh, compression function and uh, this compression function takes two inputs. One is 256 from the previous um, compression function. The other is the actual message. And I will compress that into a 256 output. Okay? So let's say I have a one gigabyte file, which is super long. What I will do is I will truncate and I will you know, split them up into, into different chunks. Each chunk is 512 bits. I fit into this uh, SHA-256 SHA hash function, outputs, a 256 bits outputs, hash digest, always. So that's the reason why we call them hash to fixes. Okay, now you can go back to sleep right now. Um, so this is like, for those of you who are more interested in, in internal details and more interested in cryptography like I do, so this is uh, how it actually works, okay? So this is the internal of uh, shadow fixes. Uh, first of all, uh, as we see, uh, as we say that the, the, the final uh, compression function will always output uh, 256 bit, 256 bit. And then uh, this entire thing is based on three very famous construction. Uh, the, okay, I'll, I'll go very quickly, one by one. The first one is uh, this compression function that I'm talking about. So uh, it's a shot how to uh, block cipher. So, it's, so th this block cipher or this compression function alone is not secure at all. And I don't know why, somehow, if you put them into this construction or if you chain them together, or if, so you can think of it like every time it scrambles the data a little bit. And if scramble the data many times, uh, more times enough, like many, many times, then it becomes sort of uh, very scrambled and you know, couldn't be inversely calculated. Uh, that's sort of the intuition. Um, and so once again, that block cipher alone is not really secure. Okay, so the way of having a block, so th this is kind of uh, recurring and uh, repeatedly being used. So this is called uh, David Ma uh, Davis Mayer construction with this uh, XOR operation over there. And then the, thing, entire, the entire thing, uh, the entire kind of chain, chain like uh, you know, uh, pipeline kind of uh, construction is called Merkle uh, Dam Guard. Uh, these are all two, two very famous cryptographers, yeah. Yes, so this is called uh, initial vectors. So there are gonna be some fixed pair parameters that's gonna be fit into as the first, because as we say, each, uh, each uh, David Mayer components or each of these uh, compression functions are taking two uh, inputs. The one is the message itself, the other is the one that's being input by the previous, by the previous uh, uh, compression function. So what about the first one, right? You don't have a previous before the first one. So that's where you, have, you need an initial ve vector. Basically, initial vector is mostly uh, either um, uh, determined in the protocol or it's being randomly calculated. Yeah, so initial vector, so that's the idea. But good question. Okay, cool. So uh, another thing, uh, which is like slightly relevant, but it's really good to know because many people actually misunderstood it. If you understood it, you are better than 50% of them, okay? So, uh, which is SHA-3. SHA-3 is another hash function. Um, it's okay if you d didn't remember all the details. That, like I said, it doesn't really matter. All you need to know is the output is 256, but this is, this, this is quite tricky because, the, because of the naming, okay? So, uh, the, so SHA-3 is actually using what's so-called KCAT, uh, uh, 256, sorry, keycap, 256. And it's using what's so-called a sponge uh, construction. Uh, it's just very interesting. It doesn't have to know the detail. Let me just tell you the intuitive idea of this. So the sponge has two phases. The first phase is you are sucking the water, okay? You're sucking the message in, in each round. So in each round, I'm, I'm getting more information about what the original message is. In the second phase, I'm releasing the water in my sponge. Okay, so basically I'm outputting certain, uh, you know, digest, you know, on a roundly basis, okay? Uh, I don't know whether they're roundly, okay, anyway. Uh, so this is kind of a, that's why it's called a sponge construction. 
So this is considered a more secure hash function than um, SHA-256 actually. Uh, so SHA-3, so NIST, NIST is this uh, organization by, uh, from US and um, it's always be asking for new proposal and to become this, uh, the industry standard for SHA function, uh, you know, hash function, et cetera. So SHA-3 is kind of a replacement or better or superior, uh, superior candidates for hash function than uh, SHA-256. But both, both of them are, are secure for, for, for the moment. So anyway, what I actually wanted to tell you is this sponge construction or the KCAT256 is different than SHA-256, okay? That's the only message you need to take. Uh, you don't have to remember any of these. All you need to know is they are from different families. So whenever you see SHA-256 and KCAT256, you immediately translate to uh, one is from Rick and Morty, okay? The other is from Sim Symptoms, okay? They are from different families. They are very, very different, but many people actually you know, uh, confuse them together. Okay, so that's one message I want, I want to deliver. Because SHA-3 and KCAT-256 is something that you're going to be using when you're writing smart contract. Okay, just, just let you know. Okay. Good. So, uh, that's kind of a deep dive of that uh, hash function. Uh, less relevant, but you know, fun to, fun to know. Uh, so, now, uh, we have, once again, the digital signatures. We have the uh, hash functions. What we can do right now is basically really, really cool, okay? Once again, NTU create this coin, this coin creation. So they're using DSA, digital signature algorithm, and which is unforgeable. Now, we can have a shorter representation of this coin to bind these two together so that when someone receive this, receive this whole bundle, what he will know is that this is actually referring to this coin creation, not to someone that NTU created many, many years ago, for example. So that's where the hash is using. So the hash, the input of the hash is, is the entire message, the entire message of this coin creation, okay? So that um, if, remember the two properties, right? The first one is there's no way you can, you can forge something, you can, you can come out with a pretty image that results in the same hash. So there's no way you can change, or and also another set of properties, anything that's changed in this original message is gonna result in a completely different uh, hash digest. So that's one of the reasons, if I include this high, that hash digest into this, this message, People are going to be make sure, people are going to uh, very certain that it's not be, you know this is correct, okay? So let's say I want to pay it to Bob. The thing that I'm going to sign. So this is me. This is a uh, secret key, Alex, which is my secret key, okay? So I'm going to pay to Bob. What I'm going to say is I'm going to pay to the one, the public, the one who has the corresponding secret key or the private key of his public key, okay? Once again, I use this hash. So what this hash, this message or this uh, pre-image. Uh, the, the input of this hash, hash function is going to be what? The entire thing over there, okay? So what's going to be <coughs> look like? So this is, this entire thing is going to be fed into this hash function, and I have a short representation of the entire history, the entire history of this coin. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, anyone have any questions? Clarification? Great. Awesome. So. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes, that is correct. So the coin is first of first of all being created, then being transferred. Okay. So um, because coin have coin can have the same metadata, for example, they can have the same unit, they can have the same quantities. But how do I just distinguish them? Right. They have because they have different history. Right. Right. So and the, the representation of that history is different. Right. Okay. Any other questions? Is there a limit to the length of this history? Uh, okay. As I said, what's the output? What, what's the length of this? Um, oh, I see. See? So once again, the question is, is there a limit to the length of the history of this coin? Okay? So what's the output of this hash function? Always 256 bits. Regardless of the original message, how long it was, it was. can be 10 gigabytes, 1 terabytes. The output is always 256. So this message wouldn't be like overflowing a lot or gonna be super huge. Okay. Hope that you know clarify things a bit. Oh, awesome. Okay. So right now, <clears throat> let's go back to the original goal, which is want to build a secure digital cache, and we're already satisfied uh, what we're seeing. Okay. Uh, can we do the validity check if I sign something? If I sign this coin? Yes, because digital signature. I'm, I'm assuming that no one steal my secret key. I'm not revealing to anyone else. Uh, can anyone steal my coin? <coughs> no, because they don't know my private key. There's no way for him to get that lucky to guess my private key, for example. Okay, that's the kind of reason. So, uh, <coughs> just a 
Yeah. I know that it's, it's quite a lot of information for probably some of you. And um, one nice thing that I find that I find fascinating in cryptography is this: what I conclude as cryptography is this power in asymmetry. Right? You have this wrong witness that is mind blowing. To be honest, it's like I the first time I heard about hash function, I was like, there's no way I couldn't do an inverse function, inverse you know uh, uh, operation. There's no way. Uh, but that's the power. That's power in, in cryptography. So <laughs> anyway. Um, you can always see this this thing um, in, in cryptography, but okay. So um, is that good enough? So we still have a second point. Uh, as you can see, it's not good enough. So the the problem with the previous one that we already come up with, which is already pretty awesome, uh, is only one problem left, which is although this as a whole is truly valid. But when I spend it to Bob, I'm Alice, once again, I'm Alice, I receive a coin from TD, I'm trying to spend it to Bob, okay? <coughs> when Bob receives it, he's, he, he's pretty sure, you know, this, this whole thing is valid, right? It, it's all following all the DSA, all the hash function, it's all good. But how does he know that I didn't, you know, before sending to him, I didn't send to Dave? There's no way for him to know, because from Dave and Bob's, if, if, if they didn't talk to each other, okay? If they didn't talk to each other, from their point of view, any of this chain or history is valid. That is called the double spending problem. Okay? I'm double spending this coin, the same coin that is valid from both of their points of view. Okay? Do, you, do, do everyone see this problem exists? Okay, that's good. That's great. So, how do we solve this problem? Basically, hash pointer. So, uh, a lot of you have already done the, the challenge, then you probably have a basic idea of what hash pointer is. So let me just remind you, for those of you who haven't, uh, hash pointer is this data structure. Once again, data structure is the way that, you know, how data is being managed and updated. Oh, sorry, how many data relates to one another. So um, let's imagine that uh, this is a, so this, this is a, a BAL or a, a, a big binary files. Um, it's, it's what the, all the data is, okay? So it, within this data, data field, there's a lot of messages, there's a lot of coin history, for example, <coughs> let's say, right? And then the next block, the next block, what it does, they have two fields. The first field is called previous hash, previous block hash. The second field is the data itself. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm using, I'm, I'm uh, sort of uh, summarizing the history before me using a hash function. So I'm summarizing this entire block and put it into a hash function. I'll put a digest which refers to the previous, my, my mother, or my, my father, my parents. It's over here, okay? I don't have any other, any other part of parents. A different parents will result to a different, to, entirely different hash digest. So that's kind of um, inevitably a, a chain that is really hard to break, right? So someone wants to claim that he's, which is not my ancestor, but he claimed that he's my ancestor, I can definitely prove like all the way, I, I can calculate her hash, and all the way back, I'll see the hash doesn't match. Do everyone see this hash pointer, the idea of hash pointer, where I have a data? So this idea, what, why do we need a hash pointer? Why, why do we need a hash pointer? Anyone? Okay, so the answer is, you want to have an order among things. We're trying to solve the double spending problem here. Let's say, how does the bank solve the double spending problem? If I already spend some coin at some banks, banks already deduce that from my balance. He's always keeping track of the ledger. He knew which transaction came first. What if we have a ledger who can do this, the same thing, which is using the hash pointer, okay? So we have a clear order transaction book, okay? So uh, particularly, let's say me as, a, as Alice, I already signed this coin transfer transaction in this block where I said I want to transfer this to Bob. Okay, so Bob is over here. So Bob is sure that the, in, in EBC there's no conflicting, uh, conflicting spending transaction that's referring to the same coin history. Then he will be sure that this transfer transaction is valid. Okay, so in a sense, if later on I want to send this the same coin to Dave over here, it's not possible. People can val ver verify that because I'm already including this in the history. It's already part of the history. Okay, so the assumption is everyone, okay, once every block is being produced, the hash of the block is being broadcast to everyone. So everyone knows the current head, so-called, the, the pointer that we're pointing to, the current block 
that's being produced. So once, the, once again, let me repeat. So once every block is being found or being produced, the hash of the block is being broadcast to everyone. Okay. So um, let's say later on. So there's no way that I want to go back and and, and claim. So this is called non-repudian uh, properties, where I, I couldn't, um, you know, claim that I didn't spend this coin because everyone has that hash. Okay. Everyone has that hash that right now. Okay. And if I try to spend some coin over here, there's no way. People already see that I spend this coin right here. Uh, so once again, this hash pointer give give us a very nice ordered history. I hope that's clear. Any questions? Uh, okay, so they don't know the information. Yes, so uh, I'm assuming that if, if you have the information, you can verify. Is that true? Yes. That, that is a very good question. So the question is, if I don't have the, the, the block, the actual block, how do I know that you are not cheating? There's no way. You, st you, you definitely need the actual data, in the, the, the actual transaction in the data block in order to verify that something is, over, is part of the history. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, one terminology here is what happens if we we'll trace back all the way back to the first block? Uh, when so there's going to be a so-called a block height. Okay. From the first block, next block. So the first block when block height is zero, um, is called the genesis block. So some of you, when you're doing the the challenge, we we already give you a link to what the definition of genesis block. So basically, that's what what it is. The block the block height with uh, the block height of zero. In the hash pointer is called the genesis block. Okay, okay, and each block have a block head, uh, a block height, which is how many blocks does he have before him? Okay. So uh, one interesting use case is to use this to build a temper evident block. And what does that mean? Is, for example, let's say <clears throat> I already predict the outcome of U.S. election way before Donald Trump was was elected. Okay. So I want to prove to everyone else that I'm the first one in the world saying that, doing that claim. How do I do so? I need something to prove in order. Say something, you know. So some uh, people could know that this block is being produced in 2014, and I already include some kind of data over there saying that I knew that Donald Trump is going to be elected. And then that's kind of the proof, because everyone, assuming everyone has all the entire chain and all the data, he can, he can verify that I couldn't make up another chain or you know an, another thing you know because everyone already have the hash function uh, the, 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 the the output the output hash okay I hope that's clear so it's like if I tamper with the history tamper with the evident uh, sorry t tamper with the history it's going to be evident it's going to be very very obvious for everyone else okay so that's kind of a, a tamper evident lock uh, that's one of the reason why people are saying blockchain is immutable. Okay? That's one of the reasons. The second reason will, will be discovered will, will be will be covered in the next slide, in the next next workshop. Okay. So for now, as you can see, once you immute the history, meaning you change part of the history, you will get a completely different hash right now. Okay. So that's one of the reasons, but that's not all. But we'll, we'll be covering why it's uh, like immutable. Uh, this immutability that all the people are talking about. Uh, how does it? Wh wh why is it the case? Right. Okay. So now, good job. And we have a secure uh, digital cache, and we have this. Uh, we can do proof of valid ownership once again. Digital signature as well as hash function that refer back to the entire history of the coin. Uh, no double spending. How do we do it? Using a hash pointer to provide an order among the transaction. Okay, I hope that's clear. Great. So that's the secure part. I haven't talked about the later part, which is digital cache. How does digital cache actually looks like on Bitcoin? This is a very interesting point, okay? So, on Bitcoin, um, the way that they represent each transaction is very interesting. Um, we, I will be ignoring, for simplicity reason, uh, for the discussion, uh, for the sake of this discussion, we'll be ignoring all the other metadata right now. So, each transaction right now, you can think there's a, there's a few inputs, there's a few outputs. What it says is, this transaction is funded by the inputs, and it goes to the outputs. That's Fair enough, right? Quite simple enough. It's like a pool of water where you have a different pipes that pulling the water in, different pipes that the water is going to go out to. So that's uh, how the transaction will look like. So imagine I'm Alice, uh, and you give me two Bitcoin, which, and if you want to send the Bitcoin to me, let's say, or, uh, oh, sorry, I already got the Bitcoin, sorry, I already got the Bitcoin. So I'm the only one, I'm the one who can fund 
I, I have the coin, right? I can find this transaction, and I can decide which this pool of water goes to. Okay, I choose to go. I choose this two Bitcoin to Bob. That's a valid transaction. Okay, what's missing here is my signature. I have to say, you know, I, I'm willing to give it to Bob, for example, and assign it using my secret key. Okay, so with my so uh, for those of you who couldn't see it at, at the back, um, this is a signature of mine. So uh, on the input, I'm saying that I'm spending something that I own. I'm I'm, I'm uh, ordering or commanding that this this input goes to certain another address. Address is like a public key of the Bob. Okay, I'm commanding it goes to Bob. So when Bob receives that, what he can do with it is he can find another transaction that he can control. Okay, so he will say, I'm willing to send to Charlie one Bitcoin and then send back one Bitcoin to me. Okay, and then he will sign. He, oh, definitely he will sign because this is something. This B two Bitcoin. First of all, if I have this and this transaction is being included in, into the in, onto the hash pointer onto the blockchain, already becomes part of the history. So me as Alice, I no longer can spend this, right? Because it, because this coin has already been spent. So this this is the actual unspent coin over there. Okay, I don't own this coin anymore. It's being spent to Bob. Bob control this to Bitcoin. He can decide that I spend one Bitcoin to chart it. So this transaction once again has inputs and outputs. Okay, so right now, for simplicity reason, we just assume that input has to equal outputs. That's considered a valid transaction. Otherwise, uh, Bitcoin is gonna lost. Uh, it's gonna be you know disappear somehow. Okay, but in reality, it's not the case, and we'll explain uh, why the input may, in some cases, in most of cases, are not actually equal to output next time. But right now, for simplicity, just, just, just take it um, no as absolutely equal. So the nice thing that we have. With that kind of construct, okay. Do everyone understand the kind of uh, transaction? How transaction looks like in Bitcoin? Any questions? Okay. So with that, what we can do is, how does a lot of transaction looks like as a whole? Okay. So let's say uh, someone has uh, ten Bitcoin, which is the input of this transaction, and every transaction has input and outputs. So these outputs, we have, we can have multiple outputs. Right? I can give it to multiple people. I have ten Bitcoin. I'm rich. So what I can do is I can give to someone to this, this address and to another address. Okay, this can be the, the same person. To be honest, right? these two addresses can belong to the same person. These two public key can belong to the same person, but it just belongs to two two different public keys. So this public key can be used to fund another transaction over here, and this six B coin can be used to fund another transaction too over there. So once and once again, we're spending the coin. Okay, ultimately at the end at the end of this entire beautiful graph. Is this so-called unspent transaction output? Okay. So let's imagine uh, at this point in time, all the transaction six, transaction three, all before them is being included into this blockchain. It already became part of the history. Okay. So what people are able to see is only what output hasn't been spent yet, as well as the history of how is it is being spent. Okay. So this. Bitcoin that hasn't been spent, the so-called UTXO, it is the actual balance of mine. Okay, this is very different from the usual experience that we have with the banks, for example, where I go to address, I know how much I have. That's a state. That's a basically a state model that will be discovered. I will be covering in. So, which is the Ethereum? What Ethereum is using is a state model. This is a UTXO model that Bitcoin uses. So, what happens is, let's say um, many people. Okay, let's say many people have have output to the same address, which is which all belong to me. Okay, how do I calculate my my total balance? How do I calculate my, my total balance? I have to aggregate all the unspent transaction output UTXO that spent to that 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 give me the permission to use them later on, right? So someone says this output goes to Alex. Okay, so. And then this is my UTXO. Consider as a, my UTXO right there, over there. At the same time, someone else can spend this this six UTXO to me as well. So my balance is calculated by aggregating all the UTXO that's under my public key. Does that make sense? So that's how you calculate balance in Bitcoin. It's slightly different, um, but it's interesting because it, this is this is much more simpler um, than like a Bitcoin is started out like to just. Start for, for this like uh, financial institute, uh, financial instruments. So for a transaction and a money ledger, this is good enough. But for some other application, this might be um, a bit troublesome. Okay, so that's the idea.
Okay. Uh, what about changes? What if I don't want to spend, because like I said, the input and outputs has to be equal. What if I have 50 Bitcoin and I don't, I, I only want to spend like, uh, I don't know, uh, 0.5 Bitcoin. What happens to the rest? Anyone? I already have the answer. How, how, do, you, how do you deal with the change? You send it to yourself. Exactly. You send it to yourself, right? As long as the input and output is equal, thank you. Um, as long as the input equals the output, then, um, and I, ha I have to append my signature over here, right? And I have to set, this is my public key, which is to me, back again. Uh, this is another, another one, the actual recipient of this 0.5 Bitcoin, okay? So that's how you do change um, in, in Bitcoin case, right? Keep the change, send it to yourself. Okay, so putting it all together, we have proof of ownership using DSA and hash function. We have no double spending using the hash pointers. We have UTXO model, which is how all transaction is actually being represented and being recorded on Bitcoin, uh, on Bitcoin network. So this is kind of the thing that you will see a lot um, in one way or another, okay? So this is actually how a block looks like. Remember the block has two fields previously in the hash, in the hash pointer. One is the previous hash. The other is the actual data itself, okay? So the previous hash is the previous hash. There are some other metadata, for example, saying this is the block number, the block height. How many blocks has already happened? Okay, for example. So these are some metadata that's being included in the Bitcoin in the Bitcoin block. Okay? And the actual data itself is all the transaction that happens before the last block until this time. Once again, the actual data in the hash point in the hash pointer or in the blockchain is all the transaction that happens before the, the previous block is found until this block is found. Okay? So I include all the transactions. How does the trans transaction look like? It's just a list. So there's a lot of items on the list. Each item have inputs and outputs. One input can have multiple outputs. Multiple, you can have multiple inputs, one output as well. So basically two are found in this. For example, uh, Jun Yu and I want to give Derek. Okay? That's kind of what, what this function looks like, uh, what, what this transaction is going to represent. So I'm going to explain what this means. So this, uh, for those of you who couldn't see, uh, the input says, uh, number 66 and then 3, so index 3. What I'm saying is basically saying these inputs, you have to go back to the block number 66, index number 3, which is like this is the index number, so here's a list of transactions. You have to go to output 66, which is somewhere here, for example, and this is the, the, the 66, which is the last block, right? This is 67. Last block, uh, the third index have the outputs, right? This output has to belong to someone. So I'm saying this output belongs to me, and I have to append a valid signature here, okay? So I'm saying this goes to Bob and Dave. That's a valid transaction, okay? So this is, this is how the inputs and output, the unspent transaction is being chained and being funded, like being used to fund another transaction, okay? So if I claim this, basically I'm saying uh, in block 66, someone <laughs> is sending me something, and I, I have the full control of the outputs, of that UTXO, okay? So, very particularly, very interestingly, what about this one? The input says none. The input has no UTXO at all. And the output goes to out <coughs> with a number 25. What, what, what is this transaction? Anyone can tell me? Coin Go ahead. Coin uh, very similar, very close. It's basically coin creation. No one owned this before. Now it gives to me. This is how Bitcoin came about, new Bitcoin came, came to the supply pool, okay? It's basically coin creation. Someone has to create this coin. Right now, in our example, only NTU can create, okay? And in the next workshop, we'll be explaining who has the right to create a new Bitcoin. Because you don't want anyone to create a new Bitcoin, right? Otherwise, it's gonna be inflating all the, all the time. And Bitcoin is gonna be worth nothing, right? <coughs> Although it might go to zero anyway, so <laughs> even so. Okay, so we'll be explaining, uh, so, so just, just from this semantics, Side of things, you knew that's a coin creation, okay? <coughs> right, so uh, just bear with me uh, a few, another 10 minutes or so, okay? So that's uh, secure digital cash. We already achieved that. Uh, I think most of the things are quite clear. Uh, if not, please ask questions. Okay, so now let's move on to the next one, which is pretty simple right now, uh, which is pseudonymity, okay? Pseudonymity, uh, the first thing is, <coughs> 
the idea of pseudonymity is how does your identities on a digital world relate to your real life identities, okay? So if you're completely anonymous, there should be no link at all, okay? Pseudonymity says there's very little, you know, barely, you couldn't find any relationship. And why is that? Why there isn't any link between my identities on, uh, on blockchain with my real life identity? The reason, of course, is that the public key is my identity, okay? So in Bitcoin and Ethereum cases, in Bitcoin cases, the hash of the public key is your, is your identity. Uh, in Ethereum cases, the first, uh, sorry, the last 20 bytes of the hash of the public key, which the last, so uh, this hash is gonna be 32 bytes long, um, and uh, you, you concatenate it to the last, two, so that doesn't matter, so that's a uh, matter of details. You can just take it as the hash of the public key, as your identity, okay? So why this, having this, or setting my identity like this, um, gives this pseudonymity property. The reason why, first of all, is I can create as many private key as I can. This is the algorithm that known to everyone. I can get a random source, provide, uh, and randomly select or randomly choose a private key, and then derive the public key that corresponding to that, and that's my new identity. I can create as many as I want, and this will lead to some very difficult problems in a lot of the protocol design in Bitcoin or, if, or blockchain spaces, which is called a civil attack. Civil attack is basically defined as anyone, because this is permissionless, anyone can create any, a lot of identities. So if let's say we were trying to do a voting, right? If we were doing a US election or a Singapore selection, one man, one vote. I knew your identity. I knew you only have one vote. But on blockchain, you can create as many identities as you want. So there's no way you can do one man, one vote or one public address, one vote. So that mechanism, is out of the block, so it's, it's, it's you know, uh, no longer considered as a candidate, okay? So that's kind of uh, the, the idea of uh, the identity and the civil attacks, okay? Now, the next thing is, do I need, even need to be a human? So, uh, so there's a funny saying, where I say, you know, uh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a cat. So you can create as many identities, it doesn't have to be controlled by a human. Basically, you can, you can be controlled by a bot, uh, by anything, right? So, um, one, one more thing, uh, for those of you who are more interested, is it truly untraceable? Uh, is it truly, you know, completely isolated from your real life identity? So there are a lot of academic papers that are very, very interesting, and we can we can look look, in, look into them uh, next semester probably. Um, so basically, those papers are, are are using some network analysis. For example, let's say you are a professor from uh, NTU, and you receive your salary every month on fifteenth uh, using Bitcoin. So NTU pay you in Bitcoin. So. And your salary is basically fixed, right? At least for a period of time. So there's a kind of pattern. And you also, you are leaving in a certain time zone, right? So you're only spending, you are only active for a period of time. You're not active for 24 hours of time, for example. So with this kind of behavior analysis and also that network analysis, who do you talk to? Who do you send money to? Are there any well-known public key that I know of? For example, let's say NTU probably is a very well-known um, public key or identities on the blockchain. And I see that, that, that this, this identity sends you uh, every 15th of the month. And that probably knows you, you are a staff here in TU. So that's kind of uh, one simple idea of how do you de-anonymize de on Bitcoin, on, on blockchain. So uh, once again, these are, and how do you combat that? There are uh, some many, many ways. In Bitcoin, there's a very famous protocol called uh, CoinJoin which is basically saying that uh, every transaction you can have different coins, so you're joining them together. Um, and this, uh, okay, so I, I don't think, I, I want, we, we, we don't want to go into detail because of the time, time limits. Uh, so there are some other fancy, uh, fancy uh, cryptographer called re-signature. If you're interested, uh, talk to me afterwards. So these are some of the, the things that we can help to um, combat so sort of a Bitcoin de anonymization Actually, there are uh, other cryptocurrency uh, for example, Minera, if you heard of it. Minera is basically using re-signatures to give back the anonymous, or the anonymity property back to the blockchain, uh, or at least have better privacy uh, um, uh, you know, guarantees. Okay, so once again, identities on um, blockchain. Let me just give you a very simple example. So this is some uh, the, the picture that I used last year. Um, so the address is basically your identities. It's the hash of your public key. So I can, I can provide, I'm calling the same function, which is create an account, okay? Account.create. I'm creating the same account. So each time when I call this function, this function is getting a random seed from my hardware somewhere, right? And I get this hardware, I, I randomly choose my private key. So the private key is different, right? The private key is different. And then I will derive a different public uh, address, which is my identity on blockchain. So I, uh, basically the thing I'm saying is I can, <laughs> 
you know, uh, with very little uh, cost, low cost at all, I can produce as many identity as possible. So you just have to keep that in mind. So that's the second part of the thing, uh, which basically is, basically, okay, um, give me a few minutes because something very interesting is about to come up, okay? One more thing, one more thing to go. <clears throat> okay? The question is, up until this point, we already solved the first two lines, which is really, really cool. We have already built a secure digital, ca uh, digital cache, and then we have pseudo, -limited, uh, pseudo uh, anonymity. Now, how do I prove, as, as she already mentioned, like, how do I prove certain transaction or certain thing is being included into the history, right? Unless you have the entire block, right? You have the entire the data, and then you hash, you rehash the, uh, everything, and to check that that actually checks out. So that's the only way you can check something is in the history, okay? So um, having this, 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 this data, so this is, this is how currently our data we're gonna look like in the hash, hash, hash pointer. So imagine this data or this block contains a thousand transactions, okay? If I wanna prove that one of my transaction is included in this block, what do I need to prove? I need to provide the entire block. I need to provide another 999 transaction with a guy saying that, hey, see, my transaction <coughs> is included in this block. Here's another 999 transaction. You can do the hash yourself, and you can see the hash actually checks out. Of course, the guy can do it, but for me, it's troublesome. I have to provide the entire block, which is not scalable at all, okay? So as more transactions be included in the block, there's no way you can, it's becoming prohibitively inexpensive for you to prove that, okay? So that's the idea. So how do we do that? How do we solve this problem? Which is very important. If you're sleeping now, uh, please wake up, okay? So the way we do it is Merkle tree. So uh, this guy invented the Merkle tree. Um, he's a biology, he studied biology at Stanford when he was undergrad, so uh, magical. He's, he became, he's a cryptographer as a science. Uh, okay, so yeah. Merkle tree basically saved your life. If you want to do blockchain research, Merkle tree is like being used on a daily basis. So this is very important. Okay, so the purpose or why are we using Merkle tree is we're trying to prove a membership. As I said, how do I prove my transaction is being included efficiently, efficiently prove that my transaction is being included in a block that is very, very huge, that contains a lot of transaction. How do I prove membership efficiently? That's the reason why are we, are, we, are we talking about this, okay? So how are we doing this is through a Merkle proof. So if you are CS students, this tree structure is already familiar with you, but for those of you who don't understand, uh, who haven't seen this before, let me just give you a very brief uh, introduction. So first of all, uh, this tree instruction is a data structure as well. Those at the bottom is called a leaf. So it's a tree, the one that out, at the, at the out, outlier of the, uh, you know, outlayer of, of the tree is called leaf. And then the one at the, at the top is called the root, the root of the tree, okay? So how does this work? Let's say I have two transactions. These leaf nodes contains the actual transaction itself. All the information about this transaction is this leaf nodes, the value of this leaf nodes, okay? Now, the first thing I do is I hash this because this, this transaction can contain a lot of trans can, can contain a lot of information, right? I don't want to include all of them into a tree, otherwise the tree is gonna be a huge. Every node contains a lot of information. What I want to do is I want to use hash function once again. Okay, nice property of hash function is regardless of the input, the output is always 256 bits, which is very nice. Okay, so let's say this, I have two transaction. Okay, I have like a, a, a transaction in this tree, excuse me, um, and each one is basically looking like the inputs and the outputs, which is something that we're already really familiar with. Okay, the first thing we do is we hash this, and we've got this, this, this node, okay? Similar to X4, and what we do with these two, which are called the children of this parent, this is the parent node of these two children. What you do is you hash them, concatenate them together, put them together. So which is, if this is one, two, three, this is a four by six, you concatenate together and hash again, okay? So the value of this node, the value of any parent node is to, using the hash function and the input is the concatenation of these children, two of these children, okay? It's a binary, it's a binary um, you know, uh, Merkle tree. Okay, so uh, once again, how do we get the, the value of this one? We concatenate this, this value and this value and hash, then we get this one. How do we get the root? We do is 
we concatenate this one and this one and hash. So finally, what's, what's the um, y15, which is at the top? How long is that? Yes, it's 256 bits. So why do we need this? And how does it help for me to prove, uh, efficiently prove that I'm a member of this? So let's imagine I'm trying to prove this transaction, which is transaction x3, is part of the tree. How long the proof would be? That's the question, right? We want to be shorter than providing the rest of the seven, or rest of the seven, right? So uh, the way I do, the way that we do it in the Merkle tree is I only provide the cousin node, the value of the cousin node, along the path from the leaf node to the root node. Okay. Once again, let me repeat. So the only proof that you need to prove is the, the, the only nodes, the value that you need to prove is the cousin, the value of the cousin node along the path from the leaf node to the root node, okay? So more concretely, specifically say, say, uh, speaking, um, under X3, if I want to prove, I have to prove the value of this hash, that's 250 bits. Uh, and then people, once I provide my, my transaction and this hash, people can, you know, you can do it yourself. You can, you can get this, this hash. Okay, so another value that I need to provide is this Y9, which is this, uh, this hash. So people once have this one, you can calculate this one. So the last value I need to provide is this y14, which is the value of this node. So uh, ultimately, all we need to do is publish. When we can, when we have a lot of transactions, we put them into this tree, and we only publish the root node, which is only 256 bits. The, the transaction itself is pretty long, and we have a thousand transactions, which right now is only have eight, but we have a thousand transactions right here. Whenever we try to prove, instead of giving the rest of the seven, what I give is only three cousin nodes, the, the, the value of the cousin nodes, and as well as my own transaction, okay? Does that convince you that if I give this, the, the, the value along, uh, of the cousin node to, the, to you, as well as my own transaction, you can prove that uh, this is part, you can, you can recalculate the, the root and find that, and to uh, make sure, uh, to verify that they actually match. Okay, let, let, me, let me repeat once again, because I see uh, some confusing faces. Uh, once again, if you have a lot, you already put a lot of transaction in this block, okay, and um, you try to prove that you are you belong one of the one of the block. So instead of broadcasting, including the, the data itself in the hash pointer, instead of putting all the transaction, the actual transaction or this data in the data, we don't do that, right? So for example, each transaction this can be very very long, a long message. Instead of doing that, we don't do. We only do uh, two fifty six, the root of it. We only we only include the root into the data which is very small, and we know it's always 256 in the block, so the block is very, very small, okay? So how do I prove that I actually belongs to this tree is I will provide y4, y9, and y14, okay? So once I provide that, people can just recalculate the root and check whether that root is actually part of the block, right? The, because we already include that, that the root hash into the block data. Does that make sense? Anyone who doesn't understand, go ahead. So as long as, uh, as time goes by the, the root, Gets longer, right? That's right. The time be more? Exactly. So it will, but how fast? So well, come. Fast the more than yeah. So if, if you consider it, right? Um, so this complexity theory, uh, which are using sensibly, which is a big O that we started learning from CS one uh, in year one, is that if let's say the input, the input is right now is like a thousand, it's grow from eight to a thousand. How long is the proof for me right now? If there's a, a, a sorry, if let's say there's the, uh, you know, a hundred, a hundred transactions, how many, how many proof, how many 250 zip bits do I need to provide? Yes, so definitely not. So it's gonna be log of the inputs. So if I, if, if let's say I have, um, sorry, if I have 124 transaction in this one, then all I need to do is provide 10, so which is log, uh, log to uh, 1,024 because you only have to provide the path instead of all the transactions on the leaf nodes, which is the log. So the height is the log uh, of uh, the, the actual input, of, uh, the actual size of the input. So the proof is actually uh, significantly smaller. So that's why you can efficiently provide the proof. But if you're going to use this for a very long time, let's say very long time. Yes. Yes. So, but at the same time, like every every block, you're only including the, the root hash. But it is true that the blockchain is growing, regardless how many data you include in each block. The blockchain is growing. 
and the amount of data you have to store is growing as well. Very true. The same thing, even if you're using, let's say, WeChat, WhatsApp, the, the more message you send, the more message they have to store. It's the same thing. It's just that they have a cache, uh, uh, they have uh, like garbage collection where you know probably they'll clean up your previous history where you cannot see your previous history anymore. But in blockchain, in blockchain case, you wouldn't delete the history. Okay, it's just that. But it is, it's true. It is like the blockchain. It is growing all the time. Yeah. Yeah. But once again, um, we are already inclu including a lot of data just by providing a very very simple uh, short hash. So that's the magical power of uh, Merkle tree. Now, one question for you guys to think about, um, especially if who are really, really interested in this, is how, what, right now we can do proof of membership. How do you <coughs> prove something is not in the tree? How do you do proof of non-membership? That is something very, very interesting to explore. OK? Now. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat that uh, later on, but uh, this is the most important pictures today because this is the, basically uh, what you get out of this entire session, okay? So this is how Bitcoin on a over, uh, high, over level, uh, high level overview looks like. Once again, um, forget about, first forget about the Merkle tree first, okay? It's first and foremost a hash pointer, each block pointing to the previous one using the hash of the previous block, saying that this is my parent, this is my history. No one can deny that, no one can change that. Okay? The next thing, of course, saying that this is the block height, for example, how long am I from the Genesis block? Okay? The next thing is the data itself. Instead of publishing all the transaction into the data, we're only including the Merkle root, which is only 256 bit, as a shorter representation of all the transaction that happens in this in this block. That's what actually be included in the Bitcoin block. So there are some other fields, but for our purposes, this is good enough to know. And this is how blockchain looks like. So the next time if someone shows you this picture and tells you some other identities, uh, sorry, other properties, or any properties, if at all, you knew why that is the case. You knew why it is immutable. You knew why you can, pr you can prove membership very efficiently. Why someone, if you query, where is the transaction? Someone can find it very, very quickly. And that is basically the scope of today's talk. Okay. Once again, uh, the overview agenda, we have achieved so much, um, like from motivation to data structure, cryptography, to pseudonymity, and lastly to an improvement on how can we, using Merkle tree, on how can we do proof of membership more efficiently. Um, I hope this gives you a very nice intro um, of like uh, how Bitcoin works uh, on a very high level. So the next time, which is going to be more interesting, is right now we're all assuming that the block just come out of the blue and it's magically being produced, and we just all we need to do is append it to the history to to uh, uh, a chain of, uh, the hash pointer, right? So the next time we're going to be talking about how a network of nodes come to an agreement on who gets to propose a new block and what transaction do we get to in be included into, into that certain block, right? And that is something more interesting and honestly, uh, you know, very exciting. So lastly, lastly, uh, as we mentioned, there are gonna be some uh, assignments for you guys. So uh, there's no way we can cover over everything in, in just two hours times. So assignments, first of, first of all, the easy one, the easy one, uh, and don't worry, we will send these slides to everyone on, on Telegram, and we'll show the Telegram later on. So the first one is you want to draw out the most important pictures, which is how the blockchain actually looks like on a data structure point of view, on a paper. And as you write on the paper, please talk to your, speak to yourself, saying uh, what this component is for, why is it here, why are we using this, why do we need a hash pointer, why do we need a, a, a hash function, why do we need a DSA, etc. Okay, what are they and what are they used? So if you couldn't do that, uh, either you go back to the slides or you ask us on the Telegram. Okay. So uh, the median level of um, work is the, uh, the reading materials. The first one is a blog post. So this blog post contains a, a very, very nice description so, uh, of how blockchain works, but it contains the part of uh, what will be covered in the next session. So what, we, what, I, what we would recommend is read the first half, 
okay? Which is basically what we covered today. Okay? Read the first half until uh, you hit the point where he says uh, distribute consensus, you can stop, and we, we will cover that next time. So uh, another reading is that th this book, which is the um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency technology, uh, uh, technology the uh, Princeton, will, will, okay, in the future we'll be referring to them as Princeton textbook, okay? So because it's written by a few Princeton professors. So uh, the Princeton textbook, it, the introduction session, as well as the chapter one, we'll be uploading this PDF file uh, to our Telegram group as well. So the hard problem, the hard problem for those who are keen and very, very curious, you can always explore it with us, is this how do you do a proof of non-membership, okay? So just a, just a hint, you have to change the Merkle, the Merkle tree itself, okay? You have to come up with some different design of the Merkle tree itself, okay? There actually have been a lot of papers being published on, uh, not really a lot, but no, number of papers published on how to prove, uh, efficiently prove uh, proof of non-membership. So uh, with that, we conclude our session and we, uh, would definitely appreciate if you can do like spend another five minutes or so, like four minutes or so, do a quick uh, feedback because we want to improve as well. This is not like a professional lecture or anything. So uh, tell us what you like and what you dislike. How can we improve? And you know, yeah. And if you want to get the slides as well as uh, our future uh, announcement, please join our Telegram over there. So uh, if you already download the Telegram group. Go to search into blockchain and you will get into our, 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 our group. Okay, thank you.